So welcome everyone. Welcome to our Sunday morning meditation class um, here offered by the Insight Meditation Community of Washington, IMCW, and the Center for Mindful Living, CML, which is part of, uh, part of IMCW, and a vibrant community in its own um, respect. And I um, hope everyone's having a good Labor Day weekend. And I wish uh, happy holidays coming up, Shana Tova, for all who are celebrating the Jewish holidays, New Year coming up. Hope everyone is keeping healthy and well. And um, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been here. Um, I was at, out of town. Um, I was in uh, Portland, Oregon uh, for the last week. I just got back yesterday. I was out seeing my son there and uh, I'm going to share a little bit about just some of the things in the talk about being being out there uh, it's, it's good to be good to be back good to be with you and uh, we're looking forward to our our time together today the theme that I'm going to be um, talking about today and maybe introduce it early on is is kindness and loving kindness in particular and and the qualities associated in the Dharma teachings with kindness, particularly loving kindness and compassion and appreciative joy, all those kind of qualities. And uh, we all, the format will be pretty simple as we normally do these days. We begin with a, uh, we begin with a period of meditation, maybe 20, 25 minutes, be a talk, similar length, in 25, 30 minutes. Then uh, Emily will lead us in some movement and uh, some mindful movement, get into our bodies, and then we'll, um, we'll have some sharing. Um, I think we'll have some sharing in, in uh, breakout groups today. And, uh, and then we'll come together, back together in the full group and um, have a, a short meditation to finish and a particularly warm welcome to those who are joining us from outside of our immediate area um, Susan in Pittsburgh and please feel free if you'd like to um, just share in rename yourself if you like um, where you're joining us from Siobhan in Connecticut and um, Denise in Albuquerque, New Mexico, good to see you, and Diane in North Carolina, Kirsten in Gaithersburg, but that's pretty local, so good to see you, and uh, Melinda in Vermont, Ursula in Zurich, representing Europe today, that's great, Heather in Maine, and uh, I don't know if I'm missing anyone from out of, oh, Lisa in North Carolina, good to see you. Good to see everyone. So again, welcome to, welcome to you all. We'll begin with, a, with a, a, a period of meditation, an opportunity to kind of drop into our present moment experience to, as uh, Martha Postlethwaite says in her poem, Clearing, to create a space, create a clearing in, in the dense forest of our lives. And so maybe just beginning with that poem, says, uh, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is yours alone to sing falls into your open cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. So if we think of just creating this space, creating a clearing in the dense forest of our lives and, and just really opening to whatever is present in body, and heart and mind and in the environment, just letting everything be making space for what's here. So we might begin by just 
finding a comfortable, relaxed posture. If you like, you can close your eyes, let your attention come inward. Inviting the shoulders to relax. Letting the attention drop down out of the thinking mode, down into the body. Just feel your body touching the surface beneath you. Your hands in your lap or on your knees or on your thighs. And you might do a brief scan of your body. Just notice if you might be holding some tension you might otherwise be unaware of. Maybe in the chest, you might be tightening the muscles or shoulders might be kind of tense or hunched. Just inviting the body to relax and be at ease. When we relax the body, the mind also tends to relax and vice versa when the, when the mind relaxes, the body also tends to <clears throat> relax and soften. You might bring awareness to your breathing. And consciously invite some deep, some longer, deeper breaths. So take a nice deep in-breath. Nice long slow out breath. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. As you breathe in and breathe out, just inviting a sense of ease, calm to the body, to the mind. Whenever you're ready, letting the mind, letting the breath settle back into its natural rhythm. In a relaxed way, breathing, breathing in and breathing out. And just connecting with being here. You could put your hand on your heart, if you like, or on your belly both, it's connecting with yourself, with the life that's here, this body, this breath, this heart, this mind. You could invite a, a smile, a half smile to your face, maybe thinking about someone who easily kind of lights you up, makes you feel happy or joyful. And the smile sends a message to our, to our brain, to our nervous system, that we can relax, that we can be at ease. Letting yourself relax and settle into being here. You might take some moments to reflect on some things in your life that you feel grateful for. Allow yourself to reflect and take in 
maybe it's people in your life, loved ones, people who care, care about you. <coughs> maybe it's conditions, some measure of health and well-being, security. Maybe your practice, your spiritual, religious practice. Allow yourself to take in what you feel grateful for, what you appreciate, are thankful for. Gratitude can be a powerful practice to help us step out of our focus on what's wrong or what's, what we lack or what we don't have into appreciation of what we do have. Maybe often take for granted. We can come back to all of these simple practices and reflections anytime in our meditation or in our daily life. Just the simple gesture of the hand on the heart, inviting a smile, taking some deeper, fuller breaths. Reflecting on what we're grateful for. They're all very simple ways of stepping out of our a frequent fixation on what we, what we don't like or what's wrong or what's missing, we wish we had. To keep coming back this moment, this moment without judgment, this poem, by Rita Dove called Green Koan. Thank you to Margaret. That the mind can go wherever it wishes is a kindness we've come to rely on. That it returns unbidden to the soul it could not vanish and learn to thrive there is life's st stubborn mercy given to soften or harden us as we choose that the mind can go wherever it wishes is a kindness we've come to rely on, that it returns unbidden to the soul it could not banish and learn to thrive there is life's stubborn mercy given to soften or harden us as we choose. You might let yourself open to whatever is present right now in the body, the heart, the mind. <clears throat> Making space for the bodily sensations. There's some discomfort or tightness. See if you can make space for it. Welcome the guests. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. In the words of Rumi,
notice what your overall mood or emotions are right now, what, what, what's present for you. See if you can just make space for whatever is here. <laughs> Imagine your attention as being much larger than your body, large enough to hold whatever is here so that everything can come, stay for a while, and then go in there in its own time. inviting a, an attitude of kindness to hold whatever is present, just a field of kindness, an attitude of kindness, whatever's here can be met with kindness and with acceptance, accepting that what's here is here comes out of conditions and causes. But if it's here, it's inevitable. It's, it's here right now. But what we can do is we can meet what's here with kindness. And that can be transforming. Just holding it with acceptance, with care, with kindness without judgment. can be helpful to establish a home base where you rest your attention. Otherwise, easily the mind just go, kind of wanders around from thought to thought. But having a, a stable base, the body, the breath, can be, can be a, a strong support for, for being here. So when the mind goes off, and just gently and kindly bring the attention back. <clears throat> so it might be just bringing awareness to your breathing, breathing in and breathing out. Breathing in, know that you're breathing in. Breathing out, know that you're breathing out. Kind attention on the flow of the breath. When we notice uh, the mind is off in thought, planning or remembering or daydreaming, ruminating, you can just gently, kindly come back again to the breath, to the body.
Share this from Mary Oliver. I worried. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it was taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Can I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading or am I just imagining it? Am I gonna get rheumatism, lockjaw, dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing and gave it up and took my old body and went out into the morning and sang. So meeting whatever is present with kindness, with acceptance, without judgment. this moment, can this moment be a moment of, of peace, a moment of freedom, in Dorothy Hunt's words, peace is this moment without judgment, this moment in the heart space where everything that is is welcome. <clears throat> I uh, want to share this um, more or less a story more than a poem from um, Naomi Shihab Nye, the Palestinian American poet. Um, I found I was flying for the first time in 18 months about and um, going out to the West Coast and and I experienced a lot of a lot of kindness a lot of kindness from people. And it made me think of this story. It's called Gate, Gate 4A. Wandering around the Albuquerque airport terminal after learning my flight had been detained for four hours, I heard an, annou an announcement. If anyone in the vicinity of Gate 4A understands any Arabic, please come to the gate immediately. Well, one pauses these days. Gate 4A was my own gate. I went there. An older woman in full traditional Palestinian embroidered dress, just like my grandma wore, was crumpled to the floor, wailing loudly. Help, said the flight service person. Talk to her. What's her problem? We told her the flight was going to be late and she did this. I stooped to put my arm around the woman and spoke to her haltingly. Shudawa Shubiduk Habibti Stanishwe Min Fadlik Shubitsawe. The minute she heard any words she knew, however poorly used, she stopped crying. She thought the flight had been cancelled entirely. She needed to be in El Paso for major medical treatment the next day. I said, You're fine, you'll get there. Who's picking you up? Let's call him. We called her son and I spoke with him in English. I told him I would stay with his mother 
till we got on the plane and would ride next to her southwest. She talked to him. Then we called her other sons just for fun. Then we called my dad and he and she spoke for a while in Arabic and found out, of course, they had 10 shared friends. Then I thought just for the heck of it, why not call some Palestinian poets I know and let them chat with her. This all took up about two hours. She was laughing a lot by then, telling about her life, patting my knee, answering questions. She pulled a sack of homemade mamul cookies, little powdered sugar, crumbly mounds stuffed with dates and nuts out of her bag and was offering them to all the women at the gate. To my amazement, not a single woman declined one. It was like a sacrament. The traveler from Argentina, the mom from California, the lovely woman from Laredo. We were all covered with the same powdered sugar and smiling. There's no better cookie. And then the airline broke out the free beverages from huge coolers and two little girls from our flight ran around serving us all apple juice and they were covered with powdered sugar too. And I noticed my new best friend, by now we were holding hands, had a potted plant poking out of her bag, some medicinal thing with green furry leaves, such an old country traveling tradition, always carry a plant, always stay rooted to somewhere. And I looked around that gate of late and weary ones and thought, this is the world I want to live in, <clears throat> the shared world. Not a single person in this gate, once the crying of confusion stopped, seemed apprehensive about any other person. They took the cookies. I wanted to hug all those other women too. This can still happen anywhere. Not everything is lost. This can happen anywhere, not everything is lost. I was saying I, I felt really um, connected with the, the, with that poem or that story really um, traveling really for the first almost first first flight in a, almost a year and a half and um, as I said I, I experienced a lot of a lot of the ordinary kindnesses you know the small kindnesses. Um, you know, I found myself in a three seats and a, um, a young um, Middle Eastern origin uh, child, young girl, six years old, um, was sitting between me and, uh, and a woman from um, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And we, you know, the little girl didn't have anything to write with and I had my, my lovely colored pens, red, blue and purple and I you know gave them to her and and the Ethiop woman originally from Ethiopia was um, you know helping her with her drawing and stuff and I, th I said to her I, I said how old are you how old are you I said are you, are you seven and I held up seven fingers and she said and she held up six <laughs> she said six my, my granddaughter's seven so I kind of estimated that she was pretty close um, and I was um, I was just taken by just a, a lot of small kindnesses of just of the humankind that uh, Naomi Shihab Nye um, speaks about in her in her 
story poem of gate gate 4a and and <clears throat> i i was um a number of times this week in portland oregon um, my son lives uh lives in the downtown area of portland and has an apartment there and i i for probably the first time I, I chose not to rent a car and I, I walked everywhere. And so for the last week I walked, I think about 60 miles around, mainly around the downtown area, a little bit of, of, of surrounding, and, you know, seven or eight or more miles every day. And one of the things that's very striking of um, people who know Portland, have lived in Portland, um, is how visible um, the homelessness is there of people living on the streets. Um, that um, you know, people who um, you know, in in, in many ways, a, a kind of I think a, a casualties of of life, casualties of our of our world, of our culture. Um, whether it's you know people who, who don't have regular work, who have drug or alcohol um, issues, abuse issues, um, mental health conditions, and are living on the streets. You know, maybe some have a number of those, those conditions, um, you know, all together. Um, but one of the things that was very, you know, comes across very strongly is that at least I felt there was a, a, a kindness and a compassion and a treating people as human beings rather than, um, you know, marginalizing them and making it hard, you know, forcing them to the margin so that they're less visible. So you have tents. I mean, there are literally, you know, scores of tents around the city, people at least having you know, shelter from, you know, storm and, and, and all of that. Um, and I, I'm not in a position, you know, certainly after a week and a number of visits over recent years, I'm not in a position to kind of assess, you know, how well they do there, you know, in terms of, in terms of social welfare and homelessness and all of that. So I'm not making, it's not a, kind of a political talk on that, but just a really about, it was about kindness, it was about respect, the, the respect I felt. Um, um, and there was something about walking on foot and, you know, walking past and seeing and sometimes speaking to people that kind of made it very much more real to me than you know, just being in a car and being in a bubble and seeing things as we're passing by. It was a whole different reality. And I felt for me, it was really, um, really a gift to be able to, to come face to face with human suffering and, um, and to be able and fortunately to be willing to to connect with it, you know, to not push it away, you know, to not kind of turn my head away. And I say it was a gift because I experienced my heart really being opened. You know, firstly, sadness, you know, sadness about the condition people were, were, living, were living in. Um, you know, sadness of somebody, you know, just on a, you know, singing and swaying on a bench, really in a mind with, you know, in, um, in his own world, really, and people, you know, on the ground and, um, and just, you know, just making some human connection and, you know, having some conversations and the gift of really, of, of, The gift of, um, of 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 having one's heart opened, um, and the, and the, how different that feels, you know how different it felt to me when I was in a more tight and contracted space, you know, um, 
a, there was a, then a sense of separation and how just opening to another or other people in their suffering could allow me to connect with with life much more more broadly much more generally much much more you know on a much more human level and 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 what it brought was a sense of 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 you know both of connection but also of well-being of connection with myself you know i was connected with my own heart through being able to connect with the suffering of of others so I've been very much thinking this week about, um, about kindness. And we talk about it a lot in, in the Dharma world. You know, I mean, in, I probably in the meditation use the word, you know, 25 times or, you know, quite a lot, you know, just <laughs> meeting your own experience with kindness. And, and I think it's hard to overemphasize the importance of kindness, kindness to ourselves, kindness to others. Um, I remember that the Jewel song, remember, in the end only kindness matters. Remember that song? Um, I don't know if that, you know, only my kindness matters, but certainly kindness matters. Um, and, and so I, I wanted to reflect today on kindness, both you know, the different kind of qualities of kindness, the different flavors of kindness, you know, what we mean by that word and, uh, and the others that like it, you know, the T.S. Eliot would say flourish in the same hedgerow as, as kindness, uh, compassion, loving kindness, love, you know, uh, they're different and they, 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 they have some overlap as well. And I've been thinking of what an, an essential quality kindness is, how it really does, I think, really ennoble our lives, you know, give a nobility to, to our lives, give a, a heartfulness to our lives. You know, the, the Buddha often used the word noble, you know, the four noble truths and the noble eightfold path, you know, and the Buddha had no time for the traditional notion of nobility, you know, of kings and princes and all of those kind of things and up there and down there, you know, and everyone in the Sangha, they left once they joined the ordained Sangha, they left behind, you know, even if they were a prince or a whatever, they left that behind. And the only, in a way, the only hierarchy was, you know, you ate, ate your meals uh, if you joined after somebody you you know and joined later you would you know go after them in the line kind of thing and and then there's patriarchy but we'll we'll save that um, for a, a, for another time but uh, you know um, but within the within the sangha that that sense of of uh, of equality and um, and nobility being the only important nobility being nobility of the heart, of the spirit. You know, that's what the, the Buddha spoke about, you know, when he talked about no, nobility. It was nobility of heart and kindness and compassion and loving kindness. The heart qualities are, are really noble qualities. They're often called the beautiful qualities as well. Um, so I want to kind of reflect a little bit about kindness and what it means. This quality of kindness um, for me means, you know, it really connotes an openness and an open heartedness towards oneself, towards others and towards the world. That's really not dependent on getting anything back. You know, if kindness is, you know, depends on getting something back, then it's in some way you know, it's in some way transactional. It's not really the, the, genuine, the genuine thing. So kindness, I think, is not transactional. Um, it, it also doesn't come and stay for long when we're caught up in afflictive um, emotions and mind states. So if we're caught up in fear or anger or blame or jealousy or these kind of afflictive more afflictive emotions there isn't much space there for kindness for compassion for love you know it tends to be kind of binary in that that way 
and kindness, genuine kindness, I think isn't limited only to, to those we care about, those that we, that we love, though it includes them, naturally includes them too. And it really doesn't have limits where maybe I'm giving a, a view of a particular kind of kindness, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, it doesn't have limits where, where we, you know, if I'm kind to one more person, it will just overflow the banks of the river. There won't be any room for anything else. Like, oh, no, I don't have time. Sometimes, you know, sometimes um, people, you know, I've done worked in the humanitarian aid with, with aid workers, you know, and, the, and, and a term that's often used there is um, compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue. But I don't really believe there's such a thing as compassion fatigue, because if there's genuine compassion, when it's not, we don't get overwhelmed by it. You know, it just, the heart get, is large enough to include everything. It's when other qualities come in that it turns into something else. So if fear comes in, then the compassion, we don't have the space to, you know, we don't have, it's hard for us to connect with that compassion. So when it's real, when these qualities, the quality of kindness and loving kindness and compassion are, are, their, are their true self, um, it, there isn't any limit really to them. That we just talked about as being boundless and immeasurable. So when I think about, when I talk about kindness, then think about this kind of kindness. You know, I realize what I'm, what I'm actually talking about is the, the Buddha's understanding and teachings of loving kindness or metta. I mean, this is really what metta is. So if we, if we are being kind to ourselves in meditation, we're really, we're cultivating that quality of metta towards ourselves. It could also be compassion if there's suffering there, but it's just that sense of, of open-hearted kindness to ourselves, to others. Now we often think of metta, I think we, we tend to think of it as a formal meditation, you know, where we do the may I be happy, may you be happy, may you be safe, filled with loving kindness, whatever words or phrases we, we use. Um, but in a way I'm more interested in it today um, in how it can be and really is a daily life practice, a daily life practice of loving kindness, of metta, a way of being, a way of living in the world day to day and moment to moment. The Buddha said, he spoke about the four heart qualities of loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy and equanimity. Um, called the Brahma Viharas or the divine abodes. He said to his followers, he said, you should always live in one or more of these states. You should always live in one or more of these states. Always live in loving kindness, in compassion, in joy, in equanimity, or more of these states, you know. And for us, it may seem like a high bar, you know, like always being, you know, can I be filled with loving kindness? Can I be express loving kindness when I'm, you know, really angry at somebody, you know, somebody at work, or I'm really worried about, you know, what's happening in the country or in the world? Or can I, you know, can I, can I cultivate these qualities all the time? But the great thing about this practice, kindness of loving kindness, of compassion, as of mindfulness, is that it's a training. It's a training, it's a practice. It's a training of the heart. It doesn't mean we're gonna be successful all the time. We're gonna be open-hearted all the time, but we can keep coming back to that just as we do in meditation when the mind goes off into stories and thoughts, we come back again. If we find ourselves caught up in, in anger or worry, we can notice that and say, okay, can I just be kind? My, can I be kind to myself right now? Can I, be, can I be kind to that person that I, two minutes ago, I was feeling really angry with? So, so, so meta loving kindness on a, on a, 
a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis. And for me, this in this last week, it was very, um, very. It was very, very supportive to be able to come back and and reconnect, reconnect with myself, reconnect with the people that I was walking past and perhaps saying hello to as I passed them on the, on the street. Um, really recognizing that for, love, for there to be genuine loving kindness, genuine metta or compassion, there can't be any above and below. You know, I'd thought of that, you know, I'd visited, you know, my son out there for maybe most of the last 10 years, you know, at least once a year for a week or so, and have been familiar with, you know, people living on the street. But in some way, I kind of felt myself outside of them, you know, separate from them. You know, I, I, there was a, a kind of a, there was certainly a caring and a compassion, but there was also a separation. There was a distance. Um, you know, sometimes even thinking, oh, I wonder if people might think of me as a homeless person as I walk along the street and, and almost feeling kind of defensive about that. Oh, no. And then seeing, you know, oh, there's separation there. And one of the things I found this, this week was very much a breaking down of that, that sense of separation, that sense of me being in any way different from above, you know, no below, no above and below, no, you know, better than, worse than, um, just really seeing that they were like me and I am like them. That there was no real difference. The only difference, you know, and so Buddha's teachings would, you know, would counsel and remind us the only difference is really, you know, what are the seeds that we've sown in our lives, you know, or in that parable of the wolf, you know, the two wolves inside me, the angry, hurtful, harm, blaming one, and the compassionate one, and which one wins out, and the, you know, the grandparent says, the one that I feed, you know, what ones, what wolf have I been feeding? That's really the only meaningful difference. There's no, everyone, you know, is just like me and just like you, you know, that any, any sense of above and below is, is an illusion. And it's an illusion that creates separation. It creates distance and it creates suffering. You know, and we have the opportunity to to break down that illusion, you know, to break through that illusion and really see on a deep level that this person, however they are and whoever they are, you know, we could include our favorite hated politician, you know, in that and say, this person is also just like me. You know, this person was you know, was a baby, was a child, want to be, wanted to be cared for, just like me, you know. And maybe, you know, if somebody is doing harm, we're not saying that's okay. We're not, you know, we're not um, yeah, justifying that in any way. Um, but we are seeing the humanity you know, we're separate, able to separate the person from the act. We say, yeah, that's wrong, that's harmful, that's unkind, that's not compassionate. But still see the human being, the, the person as a human being, that we can do this, that, um, that this is what these qualities, the quality of loving kindness um, can, can help us to do, to keep our heart open. And when our heart is open, we're in a much freer place than when we're caught up in separation. I think we know this from our own experience of just kind of when we are in that place of separation, we're judging somebody, we're blaming somebody, we're angry at somebody in a kind of a toxic way, in a clingy kind of way. I want to share with you, some of you may be familiar with these, but I think they're a very 
um, um, very helpful um, Buddhist teaching that maybe aren't, aren't talked about as frequently as they might be. Um, because it's, it's, really, it's really helpful to think of the qualities, you know, particularly talking now about these divine abodes, these heart, heart qualities of loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, that for, the, for, those, for these qualities to be, to be genuine, they, they can't be colored by, by any kind of clinging or craving. If there's any sense of self attached to them, so if I'm being kind to somebody for an ulterior motive, or I'm wanting somebody something back from them, or being loving to them, expecting them to be loving back to me, then that isn't the fullness of the quality, whether it's of love or of loving kindness or of compassion. Um, if there's any sense of above and below uh, or any sense of holding on to a separate self, then that won't be, um, we can't, that won't be the genuine quality of loving kindness or compassion or jo joy. And our heart can't really open. We'll be, we'll be in a contracted place. I've shared occasionally a story of, of, uh, of this, which was a real teaching for me. I was on retreat uh, doing a personal retreat up in Barrie, Massachusetts, maybe a decade ago. And um, I was having a, you know, it was a nice retreat and things were going well. And I brought along a couple of bars of my favorite chocolate, chocolate ginger, you know, the ones in the green pack that you, green package that you can get. And I, I don't eat them so much now, but I used to, I really enjoy those. And I was feeling so open-hearted, I was feeling open-hearted. And they had a shelf there where people could leave gifts for other people, you know, just kind of acts of kindness. So I had a, a bar, extra bar and I, I put that on the shelf. I thought, oh yeah, that felt very nice to do that. And then I walked past there about an hour later and it was gone. And my mind went to, you know, what a greedy yogi snapping up the bar like that, you know, and I noticed how I was getting contracted around this, this chocolate bar, which I'd left, I'd given away. And yet my mind was, was caught up in judgment, you know, and I, I, it was a great teaching because I could unpack the way that it hadn't been a pure act of, of generosity or loving kindness. It was like I had a string attached to it that depended on it, things going a certain way. So presumably I had in my mind, you know, an idea that, you know, somebody would open the bar, take a couple of squares and then somebody else would, and it would be shared among people. So, but if I'd given it away, why did I, why did I care whether, what happened to it? But somehow I was, you know, my mind was contracted. So it was a good teaching for me on, when giving, there has to be a full letting go. And when giving love, there has to be a full letting go, not of, okay, I'm giving love, and, but am I getting it back? You know, is there, you know, a hook on the end that I'm kind of reeling in what I'm expecting? So that was, that was um, helpful to me. The uh, third Zen patriarch of, of patriarch of Zen, um, Seng, San, Seng San said, make a hair's breadth difference and heaven and earth are set apart. Make a hair's breadth difference and heaven and earth are set apart. So it doesn't have to be a gross, um, you know, a gross clinging, but if there's any kind of clinging, then we're no longer, the heart is no longer really open. And it's not that we're being a bad person, you know, when there's some clinging to our kindness, but it is an opportunity of seeing where, where we're holding on, where we're hooked, and how we can let go and let the, let the generosity or let the compassion be full, let it be, let it be uncontaminated, as it were, by clinging, by holding, 
by, by expectation. So like in that case of the chocolate ginger bar, ginger chocolate bar, um, it's easy to, to be unaware that, that there's a shadow side to our kindness or to our generosity. And in Buddhism, it, when, it, when the, the four um, Brahma Viharas each have, they have a far enemy and they have a near enemy. So the far enemy of loving kindness is hatred. The far enemy of compassion is cruelty. The far enemy of appreciative joy, happiness in the happiness of, an, of another would be envy or schadenfreude, you know. Um, um, the, 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 um, the, uh, the far enemy of, uh, of equanimity would be, you know, over would be, um, I'm trying to think the, um, the form or the, the um, anxiety greed, you know, would be where there isn't, where the mind isn't balanced. But as well as these far enemies, what's more interesting in many ways are the near enemies of these, um, of these, quali of these heart qualities. So loving kindness, the most common near enemy is some kind of attachment, you know, some kind of holding some kind of clinging to our love or to our loving kindness. For compassion, you know, which is the suffer, you know, it, was, it is opening the heart, the opening of the heart in the face of suffering, wanting to alleviate the suffering. The, the near enemy of compassion is pity. Pity, with pity, there's an I'm above and you're below or vice versa. There's an above and below. There's a separation. I'm here, you're there. With compassion, there's no me up here, you're that down there. The heart is genuinely open. So if there is any holding on to up or down, above and below, we can notice that, come back. Okay, can my heart be open without that illusion of separation? Um, with um, with uh, sympathetic joy, the, um, the near enemy, is um, really is joy tinged with some some holding on, some clinging. You know, it's not it's not a pure open joy. And for equanimity, the near enemy of equanimity is in is indifference. You know, with with equanimity, there's a there's a balance with the, between the joys and the sorrows. Um, the near enemy is is there's a coldness, there's an aloofness, and there's a separation. So really helpful, I think, to, to reflect on these near enemies of, um, of, um, of these Brahma Viharas, the near enemies, particularly of loving kindness and, and compassion. Think of what Milarepa, the great Tibetan teacher said, long accustomed to contemplating compassion, I've forgotten all difference between myself and others. Long accustomed to com cont contemplating compassion, I've forgotten all difference between myself and others. And Ria Khan, the Zen monk, said, if, if, only I, if only I could hold all of the world's suffering in my monk's robe, or if only my monk's robe could hold all, hold all of the world's suffering. So I want to finish this talk with um, a, a reflection from Sharon Salzberg, um, who's kind of the a bodhisattva of loving kindness um, in the wonderful book on loving kindness, many other books as well, on joy and love, faith, etc. But this really what she shared in a uh, book, Heart as Wide as the World, um, really speaks to what I've been sharing about today. She says, the essence of the Buddha's teaching is that we all have the same com capacity for compassion and for peace. This potential is not abstract or distant, not something available only to those who lived long ago in another land. 
A life of connection and authenticity can come completely alive for us now. We can make it our own, discovering that our hearts are in indeed wide enough to embrace the whole world of experience, both pleasurable and painful, is the basis of the spiritual path, and with it comes an extraordinary freedom and happiness. This way of living is beautifully described by the poet Rilke. I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. I may not ever complete this la the last one, but I give myself to it. And this it really speaks to me. He said, as she says, as we give ourselves to the practice of mindfulness, wisdom, and compassion, our habitual patterns of attachment and separation are seen for what they are, painful and unnecessary mistakes. I think it's worth reflecting on that, that, that our patterns of attachment and separation are, are really painful and unnecessary mistakes. We're actually making a mistake. We're looking, as I shared a few weeks ago, we're looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, we're looking for happiness where we can't really find it. This realization lifts the heaviness from our hearts so that we can encounter anything without getting deeply lost in fear, anger, or clinging. We can encounter anybody without being engulfed by feelings of estrangement and separation. We can begin to live in a way that enables our hearts to include rather than exclude, to open rather than constrict, to go forward with the energy of loving kindness rather than be held back by the illusion of separation. We can begin, begin to live in a way that is commensurate with our own extraordinary potential, the potential of being truly awake. This potential is the truth that lies at the center of the Buddha's life and teaching. This truth is also our truth. The unbounded heart of the Buddha can be our own as well. The unbounded heart of the Buddha can be our own as well. And the Buddha's teachings really were that, that he was able to awaken, but that each one of us has this capacity for awakening. So may we all awaken to our true nature to our true capacity to freedom of the heart. Thank you, and I invite Emily to lead us in some, uh, in some movement. Thank you. Let me invite you all to stand up and uh, notice your feet, how valuable they are, just for lifting you up from your pelvis, and notice your spine as it lifts, turning your palms out, lift them up, reaching up and gather the energy of the sky and the sun and the clouds and bring that energy to your heart and gather the energy of this group, this gathered and bring that to your heart and cultivate the energy of the earth, that which provides so much abundance. And then bring your arms out wide, stretch out into your space, arms could be shoulder height or lower around your hips. And then once again, come into mountain pose and lift your arms up, grasping your left wrist in your right hand. Inhale as you lift up and tilt over, opening up that left side from the base of the left hip out. Inhale to center, grasping the other wrist till over to the left, engaging the right rib cage and expanding. And then inhale, allow your arms to lower into cactus arms. Exhale, lower them. Inhale up, exhale lower. 
inhale up stretch your arms out wide take a look over at your left palm turning that up and with an inhale switch to turn your right palm up as the left reverses and then to the left and to the right Allow your arms to float down and move your shoulders independently and move them the other way. Coming to center, grasp your hands behind your back. Take a deep breath and fill your chest, lifting your head and then exhale, draw your elbows towards each other expanding your chest even more and release soften your elbows inhale lifting up one more time lengthening your hands below your waist and then soften gently float your arms up and move your shoulders together in a circle and move them the other way and once more, expand out, expanding into the space around you. And then turning your palms out, lift up, bring your heart, hands to prayer position and release your energy to the sky. Release your kindness to everyone here and to the earth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. It's always great to come into the body. Thank you. Yeah, just invite if anyone, maybe don't have a lot of time, but if anyone has anything um, you feel like sharing or any question to raise coming out of the meditation or the talk or the, or the breakout group today, um, please feel free and uh, see if uh, anyone either raise a physical hand or a, a virtual hand if you would like to like to share anything. As Arjun Chah used to say, how's the suffering? How's the suffering? Good to, good to get familiar with our suffering. I think Ooh. Carolyn uh, unmuted herself. Uh, who is that? Carolyn. Carolyn, go ahead, Carolyn. And um, I just have a little funny story about the cookies that uh, you were <laughs> reading about because I've actually had those cookies on numerous occasions because I teach ESL and many of my students have been from the Middle East and they would bring those cookies to share with the class. Those date filled cookies with powdered sugar on top. <laughs> so I wanted to say how they're really very good. Great, thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. I think I've had, had them on occasion as well. That's great. Um, I saw um, Peter, uh, you're on mute currently. Yes, here we are. Hi, Hugh. Uh, my name's Peter. And uh, as I was telling the folks in my group, I've just uh, moved here to Bethesda after living 15 years on Hawaii. And um, so everything is very new to me. And by the way, I need to thank Shazi, who was so great in introducing me to CML and uh, suggesting I attend this uh, meeting, which I'm getting a lot from. Uh, but in our group was, uh, actually most of the other people were from Bethesda too, but we were talking about just in our daily lives when we're walking down the street or on for me walking on the CNO towpath, greeting people. And I find myself smiling, waving, 
and uh, sometimes talking to them or saying hi. And I'm intrigued how so many people respond with such a kind uh, response in their eyes and their gestures. And I find it really fills me up. It's, I mean, and I realize because I'm so new here, part of me is doing this because I want to reach out and have friends, so to speak. But, but at the same time, I'm getting so much back as I just uh, simple gestures of a big smile and how are you today or thanks for this or what have you. It's, a, it's a lovely to have that in my life. So thank you for all for being here. Yeah, lovely. And thank you, Peter. Um, it's lovely to have you. And uh, thank you, Sharon, for suggesting that Peter come and uh, be part of uh, part of this this group. Lovely to hear that. Um, you know, it, it, I, I experienced something of the same. The, the more I can be open, the more, you know, the more I tend to get back. Um, you know, hopefully without expecting too much, but, um, you know, for the reasons we spoke about before, but, but it is lovely. I, um, I, I share, often, occasionally share um, the poem from uh, Danusha Lameris, um, Small Kindnesses. Maybe I'll, sh maybe I'll share that um, in, the, uh, in the final meditation, but it's kind of feels like it goes with the theme for today. She's kind of saying how really what you're saying as well that the you know just these small kindnesses these kind of connections with each other are really the the kind of a, what the word i'm looking for but they're they're kind of what makes life they give it kind of a fiber and substance and 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 connection and uh, and, and are so valuable and so important um, in our lives so to remember to, to share Danusha. And again, thank you and welcome to you. Uh, welcome to you, Peter. Mm, thank you. So Robin has her hand up virtually. Uh, Robin, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. One of the things that in, the, in your talk that, that I particularly enjoyed and I'm curious about is that the distant enemies and the and the near enemies that you spoke about is is there um where could I learn more about that because I find it's the, it's those those shades of gray I think where where I can easily delude myself about my motivations and you know where my where my heart and head really are and and I think putting name on those makes them makes it easier to identify them perhaps when they pop up again, which I'm sure they will. Yeah, no, that's a very, I think that's very, very good observation that if we name them, then, then they, they, I think can become less sticky and less, less tricky really. We say, oh, there it is. There's this, you know, a story in the Buddha's teachings of Mara, you know, people are familiar with Mara, who's like the kind of the, um, kind of the epitome, the <clears throat> symbol in a way of greed, hatred, and delusion. You know, it, Mara who came to the Buddha when the Buddha was under the tree and basically said, who do you think you are, you know, for thinking you've awakened? And the Buddha reached down and touched the earth and said, the earth is my witness. And then in the movies, then you, all the lights start flashing, but you know, who knows what happened in, you know, the earth is my witness. And in the kind of in the in the Buddhist teachings, uh, Mara Mara comes back at different times after the Buddha is awakened and after he's he's uh, he's teaching, you know, he's teaching, and Mara will come to, to the edge of the you know the circle of people gathered around the Buddha, and he's there, and the Buddha will see Mara and say, "I see you, Mara." And Mara would then scuttle off, you know, by being seen. And this, this, I see you, Mara, you know, relating to your question, Robin, or, or comment, um, that I see you, Mara, is like when we identify any of these afflictive states, we go a long way to really working with them and letting them go. But the first thing we have to do really is to see them, 
you know, we have to, oh yeah, I'm, there's some clinging attached to my compassion here. I'm wanting this person to do something in exchange. I'm wanting them to recognize my goodness in, re in being kind to them. If there's that there, then there's a stickiness, there's a contraction. I'm not happy unless I get back what I'm expecting, like me and my chocolate bar. And if I, if, if I can see that tendency, then I can begin to say, oh, okay, I can, I can invite that to let go. But we have to really see it. And that's why, why naming the near enemies and saying, oh, okay, this is colored with, with a, you know, a flavor that isn't really, you know, isn't really wholehearted, isn't really fully open hearted. It's got some contraction in it. It's got some wanting in it, some clinging, some superiority and inferiority. So thank you for sharing that. And I, I think it's- uh, We have one more hand up. Uh, Terry's hand is up. Okay, Terry, go ahead. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. Uh, like Robin, I live in, in Chevy Chase. And as a person of color, there have been times over the last year where I felt unsafe, where I would be walking and I would look at people and only see difference. And I appreciate you that you talked about that fear as an affliction, because if I truly don't see separation, then I don't need to carry fear in my heart as I look into the faces of people in my neighborhood and fear them for maybe how they feel about people of color. So thank you for that, the gift of that way of, of framing it. Thank, thank you, thank you, Terry, appreciate that. And, you know, I think it's also important with these, <clears throat> what we sometimes call afflictive emotions or negative, sometimes they're called negative emotions. I don't tend to use negative so much because it, tends to suggest that they're bad. I think all emotions have a function, don't they? So if fear comes up, you know, if fear comes up in you around how you're being looked at or being seen, that can be very, you know, very useful information. Um, you know, if, if something comes up that makes us fear, that says, I need to get away from here. I need to defend myself or do something. So the emotion itself, is, is wholesome, even these more difficult ones. It's what we do with them, isn't it? That's, uh, that's the issue. If we, if we start, turn that fear, we, if we solidify that fear, then, you know, then what happens is the fear becomes unpleasant and we fear the fear itself. You know, that there's, that it's like, oh, I don't want to go there. That's too scary. You know, like FDR said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Um, but if we can allow ourselves to experience the emotion and, and see that it's impermanent, it's transient, it's changing, then, then you know, we can do what we need to do. If we need to take care of ourselves and create boundaries, we can do that. But we can do it from a place of awareness and wisdom rather than from a place of, of contraction and suffering. I really appreciate what you shared. Terry, I'm, I'm really glad to have you with us today, everyone. And let's just have a very short meditation to, to finish. This will just be two or three minutes. So I invite you to, to just sit comfortably, relaxed way. And maybe take a few deeper breaths to settle, check in with yourself. What are you noticing now as we're coming to the end of our time together? You know, has anything shifted in you over this time? Anything opened up? Maybe just finish by breathing in and wishing yourself well. Could be just a, a simple phrase or a word. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering. Wishing yourself well. And then as you breathe out, wishing everyone here well. May you be well, may you be safe, may you be happy.
Breathing in kindness and compassion towards yourself. So essential if we're going to be able to, if we're going to, if we are to open our hearts to others and to the world, we have to take care of ourselves, bring kindness, compassion to ourselves. And then letting the heart be open to, to everyone else who's here all of us here together, maybe letting the circle go out more widely to, to all those everywhere in the world, maybe particularly holding in our hearts those who are suffering, those who've suffered from the recent hurricane, those who've lost lost loved ones, lost out homes, those who are experiencing economic distress and pain. All those living with the uncertainty and fear in Afghanistan, particularly women, girls, holding them in our hearts. Letting our hearts be open to, to everyone. Including those who cause suffering. Recognizing that they too are suffering. Not to condone, but to, to understand. Let our hearts stay open. We'll finish with Small Kindnesses by Danusha Lameris. I've been thinking about the way when you walk down a crowded aisle, people pull in their legs to let you by, or how strangers still say bless you when someone sneezes, a leftover from the bubonic plague. Don't die, we are saying. And sometimes when you spill lemons from your grocery bag, someone else will help you pick them up. Mostly we don't want to harm each other. We wanted, want to be handed our cup of coffee hot and to say thank you to the person handing it, to smile at them and for them to smile back, for the waitress to call us honey when she sets down the bowl of clam chowder and for the driver in the red pickup truck to let us pass. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire. Only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy? These fleeting temples we make together when we say, here, have my seat. Go ahead, you first. I like your hat. Thank everyone for your kind attention, your presence, your practice today. We're just going to briefly mention two things and then pass it over to Dan and others and for announcements. Um, I, I want to uh, mention that I have a class, a course, an eight week course coming up eight Mondays virtually, just like this on Zoom on the Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha's central teachings on the practices of of um, freeing ourselves from suffering. So in Monday evenings, beginning on September the 20th and going to November the 8th. And I've got other things coming up. Dan has um, posted those in the chat. And also um, just to mention, um, yes, to mention that uh, there's no cost for this class, no charge, um, but you are invited if you're able to, to give, make a donation in the Buddhist traditions known as dana or generosity. It's how the teachings have come down through 2,500 years through 100 more generations. 